Uh, we have been blessed so much this year and so much this month uh, going throughout the Word of God and talking about hearing from God, hearing from God. And that is important to hear from God. It's important to stay in a place where you communicate with God because if you don't uh, communicate with God, then obviously you're lost. Obviously you're headed in the wrong direction. Obviously you are uh, in a place where you're not uh, being blessed. So we definitely want to hear from God, and that, that, that's, that's very key because that's what we were put here for. We were put here to hear from him and to be able to speak out in the earth what he put into us. So I thank God that we're able to hear from him. Apostle has been preaching wonderfully, and it's been blessing me as well. Um, a lot of times when he preaches, I, I sit down and I meditate afterwards. I listen to it on the way to work or after work, and then I, I sit down and meditate. And he was talking about what is God saying when he doesn't say anything. And he didn't notice at the time, but I was going through that very same thing where God wasn't saying much. And I realized that uh, it, it wasn't that God wasn't saying anything. It was that I wasn't in a place to hear him. I wasn't in a place to hear his voice. I wasn't living in a, um, in, in a fashion where what he was, in a fashion that he was accustomed to seeing me live. I, I wasn't chasing after him enough. And so we're going to be talking about that tonight. Elder Maria blessed us with and What do you do? Uh, when you when what you see doesn't line up with what God see, what God said, and she was talking about Elijah, and uh, she was saying that basically you got to walk this thing out. You got to get into that place where uh, you're you're patient, you're willing to hear, you're waiting to wait to hear God. And so we thank God, we thank God for her and the message that she put forth. And tonight we're going to be in the book of Ezekiel. I'm trying not to be too long. Um, uh, we may have to break this up a little bit. I got a lot of content, but I'll try to keep it as brief as I can uh, with clarity, hopefully. So in Ezekiel, the 23rd chapter, and we're only going to be using one verse tonight, 23rd chapter and the 35th verse, and I'll be reading from the Amplified Version. Again, that's Ezekiel, the 23rd chapter and the 35th verse, and again, I will be reading from the Amplified Version. And again, we're talking about uh, the voice of God, hearing the voice of God. And this is the last Sunday in this month, so we're going to be closing this thing out, and I hope you're able to get something from the Word uh, today. So this is Ezekiel talking to the people while they're in captivity, and uh, he's reminding them of what they've gone through and also what they're going to go through. And then he giving them, he's giving them the reason that they're in the predicament that they're in because they turned their backs on God. And so Ezekiel is spelling this thing out as a prophet of the Lord. He's spelling this thing out so that the people don't repeat the same mistakes. I think I heard Apostle saying that if we're not careful right now in this season, what we're going through, it'll get even worse. And I believe that as well. I believe that it'll get even worse, that we'll have even more pandemics, that we'll have even more diseases, that we'll have even uh, uh, more weird things going on in the economy and in the government if we don't get to that place where we're, uh, that we're hearing from God. If we don't stay in that place where we are uh, going after him, when we are sustaining ourselves through God the Father. So, again, we're in Ezekiel 20, the 23rd chapter. You should have it by now because I've said it like five times. So go ahead and turn there, chapter 35. Turn off the TV and go ahead and put your eyes on Ezekiel, the 23rd chapter, verse 35 in the Amplified. And he says, this is Ezekiel speaking for the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, God, because you have forgotten me, your divine husband, I'm going to read that part right there one more time, because when I read it the first time, I had to stop and go back. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me, your divine husband, your divine husband, and cast me behind your back, therefore, bear also the consequences of your lewdness and your harlotry. I'm going to pause so you can think about that. I'm going to pause so you can think about that. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me, your divine husband, and cast me behind your back. He, he, he's the husband. Cast me behind your back. Therefore, bear also the consequences of your lewdness and your harlotry. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is Israel. You know, they messed up. We got a chance to read their story. We know that they were brought out of uh, 
a captivity and then they did the wrong thing. But don't put your eyes on Israel. Don't cast everything on Israel because he's speaking to us right now. I know some people don't believe that. They believe that we're beyond that and we don't have consequences. But he's speaking to us right now. Because you have forgotten me, your divine husband, and cast me behind your back, you will suffer the consequences. So we're going to be talking from this topic tonight. God is not your side piece. Ooh. I'll say that again. God is not your side piece. And y'all know, some of y'all know what side pieces are. Some of y'all done had side pieces and been side pieces in the past. So don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. A side piece is somebody that is not a part of the relationship, somebody that's not supposed to be a part of the relationship. That's somebody that uh, one member of the unity has stepped out to be with. That, that, that person is not a part of what God put together. So God is saying, I'm not your side piece. I don't want to share you. I don't want to get to this point where I got to uh, have – um, a meeting with you about who you're going to see. God is not your side piece. He ain't there for you to cheat on him. God is not there for you to use him up for everything you need and then decide to come back when you want something. Somebody could have said, hey, man, I could have got some chats or something on FaceTime or something. I don't know. Somebody send me some chats out there because y'all 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 know what a side piece is. Oh, you know what a side piece is. Some of y'all done been side piece for years and didn't realize you was a side piece. You know what that means. That means that you you weren't getting the right attention that you you, you weren't getting, getting all, all the attention that, uh, that the main person was getting. God is not a child. He's not a person, or he's not that that uh, entity where you can be you you can use him up as a sugar daddy. He's not that entity. So you got to ask yourself: Do I really want God? Do I really want to go after him? Do I really want to be in that place where I look at him as a divine husband? Do I really want to be in that place where I, uh, I'm going to constantly seek him? Do I really want to be in that place where I have to commit to him? Because when you commit to God, that thing comes with some consequences. It comes with some rules. It comes with some regulations. It comes with some promises that God, will, that God will make to you, and he will, uh, he will uh, force you to uphold towards him. God is not your side piece. He's not that, that, that piece that you can go to when you, just, when you just need something. And sometimes that's how we look at God. We look at God, uh, especially in this day and age, with all the technology that we got, with all the things that we have, with all the cars that we drive, the houses that we live in, the money that we spend, the little snotty old kids that we got that's eating up all the grocery. We look to them instead of God. We look to them instead of God. We look to um, trusting in our government sometimes instead of God. Everybody worried about this coronavirus and the vaccine. I'm not opposed to the vaccine. Go and get it if you need to get it. But that's not my God. That's not where my trust is. And if you put your trust in things, those things will fail. And we're going to find that out tonight as we continue to matriculate through this word. Um, so it, it, that, that word blessed me when I read that in Ezekiel. So I go ahead and get to my first point. And the first point is you must ask yourself, is this really what you want? Is this really what you want? When you're in a relationship with God, ask yourself, is this really what you want? That's what I had to ask myself the last couple of weeks. Because I don't know about you, have you ever been in a relationship with somebody that really loves you and just a little bit crazy? Then you got to ask yourself, is this really what I want? Because they will show out on you. They will cause some things to go crazy. You, they will cause some things to go wrong in your life <laughs> if you're not committed to them. Is this really what you want? And that's what uh, we're, we're talking about in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. We're going to read that in just a minute. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. And God was telling us in the beginning, like he told Israel, God was telling you that he's crazy. I don't mean it in, the, in that sense. I mean that God is really committed to you. He's sold out to you. He really loves you. He's into you. Um, he's jealous. So he told him, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He told you right there. And if you ever dealt with a jealous spouse, you know what I'm talking about. If you ever been a jealous spouse, you just should know what's going on. Because it, it'll hurt my feelings if you cheat. It'll hurt my feelings if something goes wrong uh, or if you go outside of the marriage to look for what you should have been getting from within. And so God is looking at us that same way today. Why are you going to see what the vaccine is? Why is nobody praying? 
Why are the leaders not turning the people back to God instead of trying to figure out what Pfizer is going to do? Instead of trying to figure out what Johnson & Johnson is going to do? How come they're not turning the people to God? How come the religious leaders are not standing up and turning the people to God? We ain't got no problem shutting down the church. And we ain't got no problem with a man marrying a man and a woman marrying a woman. But we got a problem when it's time to tell people to turn back to God. Amen? So you got to ask yourself, is this really what you want? God will show out on you. That means that God is subject to show out if he catch you cheating on him with other gods. Things, money, people. And if you ever been in love and seen a spouse that's going around doing things, or well, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, or whatever, as you were coming up in school, don't look at me like that, honey. I'm not confessing. I'm just using that as an example. If you ever been in that predicament, then you know what it feels like when you put up your all into something, and then that something turns it back on you. That's how God is looking at the U.S. today. That's how God is looking at believers around the world today. We got to get to that point where we have to ask ourselves: Is this really what you want? God ain't meant to be played. God don't want no players. <laughs> God don't want nobody that's going to continue to turn their back on him. Because he has no problem showing out on you because he loves you that much. Because he sacrificed everything for you by coming down and giving his life for your sins. So it should be no surprise when you allow other things to consume your time that God does something to get your attention. And that's what he's doing right now. This pandemic is really just to get our attention. It's a warning. And you, we may think because the vaccine go in your arm that you're good to go. Keep in mind that Israel had plenty of things go wrong, even after they had been delivered. So this is not the end. This is not the end. We got to get to that point where we're not just using God for anything. We're not just doing what you know what. When, when I was growing up, the older the older guys used to come through uh, the neighborhood and they would be looking for women, um, and they would call them sugar daddies. Because all they did was spend money on other women, but they were married. They were married. Oh, y'all acting like y'all ain't had everybody look down and look the other way. You ain't never had no sugar daddies in your neighborhood. You don't know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. They were doing these things because they didn't value what they had at home. They didn't value the relationship that they had built with their spouse. So they were coming to different neighborhoods playing the sugar daddy, giving out what they should have been giving out at home. That's how God's looking at us. You're giving out your time to these devices. You're giving out your time to the television. You're giving out your time to different people, to the job, to a career, to everything that you want to do. But where is God's time? Where is his time when he needs? Is this really what you want? I'm telling you, God is not your side piece. Is this really what you want? Because he's serious about this thing. He's serious about you. Your relationship with God will cost you something. It's going to cost something. You can't just get up in the morning and go about your day um, and do everything that you want to do. Go to go to work, come back home, do your hair, uh, talk with the kids, and do all these day-to-day -day things and not give God some time and think he ain't going to show out. This ain't what you want. That's what the young kids say now. This ain't what you want. Or as uh, Evangelist Ariel said, you don't want these problems. That's how she said. <laughs> you don't want it. So you got to think about that relationship. And God has made it clear in his word that it requires work on both ends. It requires work on both ends. He said it in Second uh, Chronicles 7 and 14. He said, what, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and do what? Seek my face. And if we're called his people, then we should have no problem with serving him. We should have no problem with committing to him. We should have no problem with spending time and meditating on him. We should have no problem getting intimate with him. And that's what he's been dealing with me about, getting intimate. Don't call that person gossiping and doing all these different things. Talk to God. God is the best listener you will ever have. Oh, man, that would work for a whole sermon right there. God is better than the best listener you, you, you've ever had. God better than mama. God better than grandmama. God better than your best friend. He's better than all the connections that you got around the world. God is the best listener that you'll ever have. Amen? And I'm not sure, he's saying that, I'm not sure if you want me, if you're just going to continue to treat me any kind of way. And that's what he's asking us. I'm not sure you want me if the iPhone got all your time. I'm not sure you want me if the computer got all your time. I'm really not sure if you want me if the people that you associate with every day got all of your time. God is saying, this ain't what you want. 
I will tear it up. I will shake things up. I will call those people to leave. I will cause everything you have to be shaken. I will cause something to, to, to break out in the community, in the world, around the world, in the U.S. I will cause a pandemic to get you to see. I will shut the churches down to get you to see that this really ain't what you want because my kingdom don't dwell in a building. My kingdom dwells on the inside of you. And if I have to, I'll come back and get that too. Oh, man, y'all ought to hear God tonight because he's in a place. He's got us in a place right now where you got to ask yourself, am I sure? Am I sure this is what I want? I'm not sure you love me if you're doing these things, if you're continually doing things that, that I warned you not to do. That's what Israel was, continually doing things that God warned them not to do after he brought them out of Egypt, after he brought them out of a horrible pit, after he brought them out of a burdensome place. And they continue to do it. So if you are called by my name, I'm going to need you to act like you mine. If you call by my name. I tell my wife all the time, you got my last name. You got my last name, so you got to act like a bum. All right? You can't bring shame to, you can't bring shame to the name. <laughs> you can't bring shame to the name. And in, in the natural, a wife brings honor and respect to her husband by taking his last name. We don't do that hyphenated stuff over here. Her name ain't about to be Thomas Vaughn. No, you get it off. I want you to be Vaughn. So I want it to be no confusion. So if you step out there and say my name, it's going to be Sandra Vaughn, not Sandra Thomas Vaughn. It's going to be Sandra Vaughn because I want them to know that I belong to somebody. And that's what God wants us to know. He wants us to want people to know that you belong to him. And you got to act like it. So if Sandra Vaughn goes out and try to act like Sandra Thomas Vaughn and try to have like both sides, that thing ain't going to work. Because we're taking it all away. you either in or you're out. That's how we discuss things. you either in or you're out. I don't play them games. And God don't play them games either. Because you're connected to my family name. And at this point, our actions are associated with that name. So when they see you showing out in the grocery store, they say, oh, that, that, that's supposed to be a kingdom citizen right there. That's supposed to be Jesus' child right there. Right? That's showing out. And the Bible says you, 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 uh, you crucify him with a press. You crucify him all over again when you embarrass him. And now he got to show out on you because you done put him in a place where people are looking at him funny. And now I, I, have, I have to get to this point where oh my I have to get to this point where uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't allow myself to go outside of my marriage with God. When the wife takes her maiden, takes on, uh, takes on the name, her maiden name, is no longer used when she takes on the name. That's what I'm trying to say. Her maiden name is no longer used. This means she connected to my family. At this point, everything she do is associated with me. And this may cause some embarrassment and reaction from the one who gave her the name. And that's what God has to do to us sometimes. He has to embarrass us because you're mine. That's what he's saying. You're mine. The church is mine. The people are mine. You are mine. And so God don't mind doing those things. And we put him to an open shame by our actions and holotry. That's according to Hebrews 6 and 6. When you do that, you put God to an open shame. You make him, you embarrass him when you do those things. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to embarrass my spouse that I say I love. I'll pause right there. I know y'all need some time to think about that one. I don't want to embarrass my spouse. And if you're really intimate with God and you're really on, uh, in sync with God and you have a good relationship with God, it should bother you when you embarrass him. So we don't go out acting like the world does. We don't go out acting like these kids are doing now, doing any and everything, and now I can choose what I want to do. I can choose who I want to be. I can choose who I want to marry, and I can break all the laws I want to break. We're not doing that because I'm married to God, and I don't want to cause him any embarrassment. Could you imagine if Sandra walked outside of the house, uh, my wife, I couldn't, it, this, will, this will mess me up. If Sandra was walking outside of the house and she does something that is totally uh, outside of character for our family, and then the perk, somebody comes back and they say, well, who did that? I say, oh, that was, they're not going to say Sandra Thomas. Like, oh, that was Sandra Vaughn who did that. Well, Vaughn, who, who, who does she, first thing, is she married? Who does she belong to? That's how people are looking at us. And God is embarrassed every time. Every time these things happen, God is embarrassed. Most people, when they're embarrassed by someone they love, they will be hurt and there will be some consequences. 
I don't know about you, but you ever dated someone or been in that place where somebody hurt your feelings, then you, you, you tend to show up. You tend to do some things. You tend to get real. As my wife said, you tend to get real petty. And you must be careful when you get into that place. You tend to be real petty because you have put so much into that marriage or that relationship. You've given them yourself. And so that's how God's looking at us. You must be careful when you get into that place of neglect and face time with God. You can't neglect that face time with God. God is used to getting that time in the morning or in the evening or whenever you give it to him. He's used to getting that time. So you can't neglect that face time with him. I know you probably got people that you FaceTime with on a regular basis or every now and then or whatever it is. You might FaceTime with your kids. And if you do that with someone on a regular basis, they get accustomed to seeing you, to hearing you, to hearing your voice. They want to see what changes are going on with your body. They want to see what, um, what is going well in your life. They want to know what's going wrong in your life. They want to know about the kids. They want to know about this. They want to know everything about you. God wants to know everything about us. He wants to know everything that we're going through, even if you think it's petty or even if you think it's menial, you don't think it's worth telling him. He wants to know it all. So I started telling God everything now. I don't know if he accepted or not. I know some of that stuff. He'd be like, man, this idiot, if he, just, if he don't shut up. I tell him everything now. I tell him jokes. I mean, they're they not. They, they're good jokes. I tell him everything. I mention things that upset me throughout the week. I tell him when I was upset with him. I do. I tell him those things because he want to hear that. And if you read through your Bible, you'll realize that that's what David did throughout, the, throughout his time. You got to tell God everything. He needs to be the person that you go to for every single thing. Don't go to, uh, to Johnny, Susie, or whoever, uh, Poo, as pastors say, pooking them. Don't go to them. Don't go to Shaquasia and them. Don't, don't talk to them about that. You need to get that thing down to where it's just you and God talking about it. And I promise you, you'll get some good guidance. You'll get some guidance out of that because God, he cares about you. He wants to keep you in that place where you guys are intimate. You can spend hours talking to, to, to someone on FaceTime, but some people won't even take the time out in the morning before they begin their day to talk to God. So that's something I want you to ask yourself tonight. What is your relationship like with God in the morning? Most of us go to work in the morning or get up and we do something in the morning. Um, and you rise up, you get eight good hours of sleep or whatever it is, and you rise up in the morning, and the first thing that happens when your feet hit the floor, usually the mind go to racing, going in many different directions. And you think about what you got to do, what you got to handle, and this and this and the kids and all this. God is saying it's time out for that. That's his time. Yeah, I know you might not be an early bird and you don't want to get up in the morning, but I tell you what, Jesus probably didn't want to come die and die on the cross for you either. But he did because he loved you. So if my people, which are called by my name, you got to get in that place where you're absolutely willing to show God you love him no matter what. I don't care what time of day it is. If Sandra needs my attention, she's going to get it. And she's natural. So it should be 10 times or 100 times more if God needs my attention. If he want to keep the relationship going. Because a relationship is not one-sided. It's not one person in a relationship. It's two. You got to do your part. We have to do our part as a nation, as individuals, as leaders. We have to do our part and give God that time, collectively and individually. We got to give him that time. Amen. I'll give you a minute to think about that. I know that you, you got to pause your show and you just heard what I said. But go ahead and do so and, and, and realize that God is looking for your time. If you get into that place where God is not getting that time, he's already told you that he's jealous. He's already told you he's jealous. He's looking for that reserved time. He's missing his face time with you, and he's wondering where you're at. He want, he's wondering where, where you're at. Why can't I find you? Why are you absent right now? You were there when you needed something. You were there when you needed healing. You were there when you needed me to save Pookie now. You were there when, me, when, we, when you needed me to uh, lay hands on grandmama. You were there when, 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 I, when you needed me to, to feed the family, to make sure you had employment, to make sure you had a roof over your head, to make sure you had uh, blood running warm in your veins, to make sure you can get up off the sick bed. You had no problem calling me then. But I don't know about you, but anytime I'm in a relationship and somebody cut the cord and you come back years later, 
trying to get back to that intimate place, or we're going to have to talk first. And that's what God's at with us. We're going to have to talk. I'm going to need you to learn a lesson first before I put my heart back into this place. Oh, y'all, 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 y'all need to hear this. Before I put my heart back into this place where we're going to be in communion again like we used to, you have to learn a lesson. And if you need some scripture for that, you got the whole new old, you got the whole Old Testament as a reference. The whole Old Testament. Because God used that example for the people of Israel. He's saying, look, I'll bring you out. But there's some things, this is what Ezekiel was telling me, there's some things you're going to have to learn first. There's some things you're going to have to go through first. There's some things we need to talk about. And any good, any good friendship, when somebody has severed it, you need to talk about those things before it's properly mended. Why? So we don't repeat the same thing over and over again. Is this really what you want? Do you really want God? Do you really want to be in that place where you're intimate with him? Amen? All right. I'll I move on. I'll move on. Y'all, those of you who are on the line, I think y'all getting it. Point number two. God is looking for the best version of you even when you're not. I don't think I'm going to finish this point. God is looking for the best version of you even when you're not. He's looking for the best in you even when you're down on yourself, even when you're down on others, even when you're down on your leadership, when you're not confident in what you're doing, when you're not confident in who you are. He still wants the best from you. What does that mean? That means that you've got to communicate with God. If you turn over to uh, Psalm 63, Psalm 63, just one in, uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, Oh, God, you are my God. This is David speaking. Oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. He didn't say later on. He didn't say after my shows got off, uh, went off. He didn't even say after my sitcom got done or when the series was over. He said, early will I seek you. Before I pick up my phone in the morning and check the text and see what's going on on Facebook, before I check Twitter and update my status and take a selfie in the bed, before I do all those things, he said, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts after you. We got to get to that place because I'm not sure we all there yet. Your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. It says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. Oh, man, we got some work to do because I'm not sure everybody's flesh longs for God. I know I got some things that I want that God ain't really a part of yet in my life. So I got to fix all that. It said, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Man, we got to get to that. My soul thirsts for you. And some of us have been thirsty for the wrong thing. I'll leave it right there. Some of us have been thirsty for men, for women. Some of us have been thirsty for uh, material things. You know, you want, you want the house, you want the car, you want the, uh, the acres to walk on, you want, you know, $20 million or what's the Powerball up to now? $140-something million. You want all those things, but you don't, you're not saying you want God. Not realizing that if you go after God, and keep those things secondary. God will call all those things to come up and chase you and overtake you. That's the word speaking. That ain't me. We got to get to that point where we thirst for God. And I'm really meditating on that Psalm 63 because David took me to a different place then. David took me to a place where you got to be really intimate with God to the point you're willing to air out all your dirty laundry. Uh oh, you'll, you'll tell somebody else your dirt, but you won't tell God. Now, that, 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 that right there just don't sit too well with him. You'll tell everybody else your problem. Oh, so-and-so did this to me, and now I feel some, this is the new language they use, now I feel some type of way because I got to go through this, this, and this. And little Chucky over there keep acting a fool, and I'm wondering why I got blah, blah, blah. God is looking at you like you idiot. You could have been talking to me about all those things, and I could have gave you a fix right away. Because Shonda and them can't give you the fix. Whoever you're talking to can't give you the fix. They can't fix those things for you. Only God can do that. And that's where he wants us at right now. He wants us in that intimate relationship with God. And the problem is we become too intimate with each other. Okay, I'll pause. The pastor said I go too fast sometimes. So I'm going to pause right there, Apostle. He wants us to be intimate with him, not intimate with someone else outside of the marriage. That makes sense? Not intimate with someone else, uh, putting because he respects our intimacy. He 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 blesses this union because he's out front of this union. So I'm not talking about your spouse. You stay intimate with your spouse, uh, Mr. Ken. Stay intimate with your spouse. <laughs> 
You got to stay at that point where you're intimate with your spouse. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about other people outside of the union. Because God blesses this union, husband and wife. He blesses this. But when you start stepping outside of that to be intimate with somebody else, whether it be a man, a woman, you know, anybody, God got a problem with that. So David says, my soul thirsts for you. This is the king speaking. He could have had anything he wants. He could have had as many wives as he wants. He could have did any and everything that he wants. He could have taken land from people. He could have spent all his money and had all his jewels around his neck and on his hand. But he saw fit to put God first in everything. So much so that David really didn't spend his money. He spent it on other people. Read your Bible. He spent it on other people first. He blessed them first. Amen. So God is looking for the best version of you even when you're not. He wants the best in you. He wants to see you prosper. He wants to see you uh, use the revelation that you have to become um, uh, prosperous in everything that you do. He wants to see you be a landowner. He wants to see you be a business owner. He really does. The problem is we tend to put those things in front and then look back at God and say, uh, can I have this? No. God says put me in front so you can look forward. Ask me for those things. And those things, tap me on my back, honey. Those things will come up seeking you. Tap me again. Those things will come up trying to find you. And before you know it, you'll be looking around like, good Lord, where did I get the house? Where did I get the car? Where did I get the kingdom? Where did I get the business? Where did I get the clothing? Why are my children blessed? Oh, I know what it is. It's because I kept God in front of me and all those things behind me. And when those things are behind me, they will come up on me and overtake me without me even knowing. That's how David was. He inherited a kingdom that really wasn't his. Go back and read your Bible. He inherited a kingdom that really wasn't his. Saul had the kingdom. But David got it because David was a man after God's own heart, which means he put God in front. He asked God for permission to do everything. Saul didn't. David did. That's the difference. He asked God for permission. He even asked God for permission when they came and took his wife and children and all of his people. God, shall I go up? He was ready to leave them behind. Oh, man, y'all got to get that right there. You got to be ready to leave everything behind. You got to be ready to leave your house behind. You got to be ready to leave family members behind. You got to be ready to leave anything that's pulling you away from that relationship with God. Leave it behind. Let it go. Cut it out because it will cause you to sever your relationship with God. And when you sever that relationship with God, God got to turn his back now. God got to start focusing on other things because you told him that, as Pastor said, you told him to kiss your butt at this point, and God got to move on. Amen. So I don't think we'll, we'll finish that up. We're going to uh, stop it right there, Apostle, and uh, hopefully we'll get to continue on that later on. But just remember that God is not your God. Not you. 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 Not at some point. God, we thank you for this word today. We thank you for the, Lord, for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for putting our hearts back to you that we won't let go of you. We won't allow things that we won't allow people that we won't allow and we won't allow things to take this place. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you forgive us of where we fall short and where we have not honor the relationship. We pray, Lord, that the connection will be restored, that the connection will be strong, and that we'll do our part honoring you in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.